grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've found that having kids, I learn a lot, or, or maybe I've forgotten a lot, uh, and I've relearned a lot, because there's a lot of stuff from elementary school that apparently I have forgotten. And uh, my kids, they often have me reading different books, things like about oceans, animals, and there's a lot that I either never knew or I completely forgot about. Last night I was reading about bugs and how butterflies have something that unrolls from their head to drink the nectar. And I had totally, I don't know if I knew that or had forgotten it, but it was new to me at that moment. Um, Elisha has a favorite book that's really long. Like I, I'm not quite sure how they got away with making this a children's book uh, because it's a really in-depth book about a skyscraper. It's packed with stuff that I'm still wrapping my head around, even though I've probably read it two dozen times. It's too advanced for uninitiated adults, much less children, but Elisha really likes it. Um, and if there's one thing that book about skyscrapers has taught me, it's that the foundation is important. Uh, to build a skyscraper, you have to dig down to the bedrock and pour tons of concrete around steel H-beams, and they're called piles, and there's a lot more details. Um, but you've got to make sure the foundation is really strong because of the immense weight that will be placed on top of it. Now, in Paul's day, they didn't have skyscrapers, but they did have trees. And Paul uses the example of deeply rooted trees, which more or less amounts to the same thing. And they still had buildings too. But a giant tree must have an extensive root system to keep it firmly planted. Paul is likewise trying to plant a church, a congregation that will last. And truth be told, the church of Ephesus is one of, was one of the most important and one of the more successful church plants in Paul's day. Paul writes, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that being rooted and grounded in love, you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I want to focus particularly on that phrase, being rooted and grounded in love. Now this was a, a revolutionary concept which was the core of the life Jesus taught and the core of the movement that so radically transformed many people, Jews and Gentiles, near and far, old and young, man and women. And it was love. The foundation that is so important that Paul is talking about for Christians is love. And he says it, it pa surpasses knowledge. In other words, it's more than just knowledge. As they say, love is a verb. Well, we get a pretty good definition of, of love in John's uh, epistle, 1 John chapter 4. Now this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now love is such a powerful word, and there are, frankly, competing ways to define what love means. Everyone knows, everyone knows that they want love. But defining love is a little trick, is the trickier part. Finding love that one can trust or learning about love, it's not as simple, but it's often a complex thing. And I think it's really pivotal that we get this definition of love right. Otherwise, we will inevitably be confused or perhaps even misled. It's foundational, according to Paul, and right, a poor foundation for love for Christians would lead to disastrous results. The love, Christian love in particular, starts with, as John says, we, not that we loved him, but that he loved us, and it centers on the cross of Christ, which is why it's so important to have a strong understanding of love of Christ as our foundation because getting the foundation wrong could lead to disastrous consequences. I'm sure you've heard in the news about the Miami building condo collapse that was caused, it seems, uh, by issues that were at the bottom of the building. Just 
really probably not a surprise to most people. Officials and engineers are still, at least to my knowledge, I looked earlier this week, I don't know if they've, I don't think they've discovered anything since then, are still investigating, so no official decision has been made, so everything's gotta be taken with a grain of salt. However, uh, uh, experts and evidence suggest that the problem, how, however exactly it was caused, seems almost certainly to have had something to do with a lower level of the building, probably some part of the foundation. And tragically, it could have been avoided. Three years ago, a, a consultant found major structural damage to the concrete slab under the pool deck, which uh, with lots of cracking and crumbling uh, of beams and walls in the parking garage under the building. Now, um, the Builders uh, Condo Association was in the process, they were, I think it was not too long until they were gonna schedule, they were gonna start fixes soon. But as you can imagine, after it collapsed, a lot of people are asking whether, with the report and information they had, should they have responded with more urgency? And it's hard to say, but there were some warning signs. Um, and again, our point for today is getting the foundation right is essential particularly when you're building something big or when there's something important. And that's exactly what Paul says God is doing with the church. Last week we read from one chapter earlier in Ephesus, from chapter 2, there Paul talked about this building, the people of God. So then, Paul says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also were built, uh, built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We can't really afford to be wishy-washy. We don't want any cracks in this foundation. We are the building. And love, the love of Christ, is the foundation. My dad, you probably heard this some measure twice, cut once, my dad used to always say. Uh, sometimes it's pretty important to be precise. And when you're building, it's very important to be precise. Plus, you know, it's got to be a firm foundation because it's God building here. And he's building his church and we are a part of this building. It's particularly important that the building be solid if you live there or if you're part of it, right? We are part of this building, the church. And what is our foundation? It's love. Particularly the love of Christ. The love of Christ is the lens through which we see and understand all other loves. And that's really uh, important and changes everything. Um, we define love um, not by looking at our dictionary or asking the world around us about love. We define love by looking at the cross of Christ. It's important to say that, otherwise we could 100% miss what Jesus is saying. And we actually might hear all the words and totally fly past the gospel and land somewhere else entirely all while still using the same word, love. That's kind of why we use that word, that little word study of loyal love or steadfast love, the kesed. The love of Christ is, we believe, is big enough to contain and, and properly orient all other kinds of love. But humanity, we often tend to, and we as individuals, we tend to exalt sometimes the lesser loves, and define the rest of love by these lesser loves. I mean, there's a, the, the most obvious example, which is still, you know, it hasn't really stopped, but the, the 60s were a time where love was talked about and extolled. And, and, you know, I'm not saying there weren't some real concerns or legitimate criticisms and questions of society raised at that time, because, um, but the solutions that were settled upon by some, like, like free love, were inarguably very different from a biblical Christ-centered love. I mean, those same word love is, is used to describe two very, very different things. 
So what does Christ-like love look like? Well, you know, the simple answer is the cross, right? Um, but the love of Christ often involves two easy, easily overlooked key concepts. And the first essential part of God's love is in Christ is commitment. Jesus, for instance, was committed to his Father's plan. He was committed to your and my salvation. He was committed to, to doing what was right. He was committed to saving God's people and, and the whole world, for that matter. Commitment is essential. The second key concept is... Um, the second key concept... One more. The second key concept is uh, Jesus did not hold on to what he had. He was not insistent upon getting his own way. He wasn't obsessed with his rights or his freedom or his possessions. Rather, his love was a sacrificial love. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And don't think primarily of your marriage. Well, there's nothing wrong with thinking of your marriage. But think primarily of how it lines up with the story of Jesus or of God in the Old Testament with his people, with the, the cross of Christ. Um, think, think for a minute of your favorite love story. Maybe, maybe, and, and it doesn't have to be limited to romantic love. Maybe it's a love of, of sports or, or of people or a family or a passion of some sort. I pretty much guarantee you there, in any of your favorite stories of love, there is commitment and there is sacrifice. Like I said, I mean, I, I can't even imagine it not being the case. Wherever there is great love, there is commitment and there is sacrifice. If you think of those people in your life who have loved you the most and those whom you have most appreciated, they have almost certainly made sacrifices for you. They were almost certainly committed to sticking with you through thick and thin. And any definition of love that is mostly self-serving, I think, is to be doubted. It seems to me that any love that does not include sacrifice and commitment is shallow, or, or at the very least, it's untested, untried as of yet. We rather love like Jesus. Or at least that's what we aim for. The love of Jesus, his laying down his life to redeem and remake us, that shows us what love looks like. It means laying down one's life for one another. It means certainly as we see what Jesus did and how his love compelled him, having compassion for the hurting, the humbled. It transforms how we treat our family, our friends, our enemies, everyone. We are committed because we know that we need the love of Christ. And your friend, your, your neighbor, your spouse, your family, your co-workers, they need love just like Christ's love too. But the last point, and probably by far and away the most important, is that the love of Christ is not just a, an intellectual belief. It's a love lived out. As the saying goes, love is a verb. The point is not to learn about Christ's love. The point is to actually, one, experience the love of Christ and to love like Christ loved. A love that is lived out in our words and actions. A love that was died for. Love that, yes, often will involve commitment and sacrifice. A love that gets involved instead of just worrying about itself. And remember, this love, that's what, our, that's what the church's foundation is built upon. The love of Christ, not upon arguments or power or popularity, rather the love of Christ. And indeed, we can thank God for that because I know that all of us have in small ways and large ways experienced the love of God in our lives. And that's exactly what he wants to continue to pour into our lives, the love of Christ. And it is indeed a wonderful thing to receive the love of Christ. So wonderful um, that we 
are compelled. We want to reflect that love and that commitment and that sacrifice and that compassion to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.